Okay, we're back. We're live. We're here with Henry Curtis, Life of the Land. Henry writes a blog called what? Ililani Media. It's getting more prolific, more yes. interesting, Henry. Thank you, you. Have you been taking pills or something to make you write so much? No, I just study other people's blogs and I look at how, uh, how stories are presented. And I've always liked writing, but this is really helping me to become a better writer. Yeah, and, and research. I mean, a lot of your material is straight research. Um, you must spend a lot of time every day. I know it takes me a long time to write 750 words. Uh, how long does it take you to write a blog? Usually two or three hours. Yeah. It's important to get the links in to figure out how to mesh different ideas and bring them together in one story. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting. And everybody has his own style. Yeah. I mean, I have always a mental outline in my mind. And I keep on changing it while I while I'm doing the writing and the research. And, all and, that. and while you can learn from others, it's important to go with your style and be yourself. Absolutely, because that's where you, you get the music. Yes. And only you can write that music, and only you can understand that music. I mean, you can understand it best in order to you know, make changes and tune it a little way, a different yes. way. So, but, yeah. Anyway, you've been writing a lot, and, and some of it is really good. I've noticed. I can't say I've read them all, but I've read a lot of them. And one of the things that caught my attention, by the way, this is Hawaii, the state of energy, and we're going to call this show The World According to Henry Curtis. <laughs> I hope you don't mind. <laughs> your show. <laughs> no, your show. <clears throat> so anyway, um, the one that caught my eye was uh, whether the Abercrombie administration had made good on its uh, energy initiative. And uh, why don't you summarize your blog on that, because I, I think we agree on many points. Well, um, Neil Abercrombie came up with a nine-point energy plan as part of his new day for Hawaii, not including climate change, which was listed separately under the environmental section. And the majority of what he proposed did not come to fruition. The biggest things that failed was transportation is still fossil fuel based. There is no Hawaii Energy Authority, as he envisioned. And he envisioned an inter-island cable and really push for that throughout his administration, even after everybody else except NextEra had come to the conclusion that it was a bad idea. Mm, yeah. Let's look at those three. Fossil, fossil fuel and transportation, boy, that's a hard one. I can tell you the Energy Policy Forum, you know, racked its brain over what could be done. What are you going to do? I mean, Brian Schatz was out there, you know, touting charging stations for a while. A lot of people were. I put it in the past because I agree that nothing much has happened. I think there are 1,800, maybe 2,000 electric cars in the state, and, and out of, of 600,000. I mean, and biodiesel might account for 1% of transportation. Yeah, fuel. although there was something in the paper recently about biodiesel. But for the uh, utility. Not the utility, for, yes. as, as generating, yeah. yeah. And, and so, um, but, but transportation hasn't really gone very far. I mean, there's, there's no technology that appeals to people. I know so many people who have bought cars, conventional cars, which are high tech these days. They have televisions in them. You know? <laughs> but, but you know, uh, you say to them, why don't you buy an electric or a hybrid or a hydrogen, which is now soon to come available, or something, biofuel, anything but fossil fuel. And they say, well, you know, it hasn't really happened yet. I'm going to stick with it. Well, the useful life of a car for most people is at least five years, maybe 10. And, and then what you, they're saying is they're going to stick with it for at least five or 10 years. And then you probably will sell your car and somebody else will buy it as a second hand yes. and keep it for another 10 years. Yes. So, I mean, it was, it was a hard one. Yes. But I agree that he didn't do anything. You know, nothing happened there. Uh, the authority ended early. It was like stillborn. It was stillborn. He, yes. he went out to the energy community on both sides, you know, the utility and those who watch the utility both said bad idea. And the regulators. And the regulators. And I think the, the universal reason for their opposition, which you know, I, I commend him for having listened, you know, because he asked them, what do you think? And they said, don't do it. And he didn't do it. That is Richard Lim's idea, though. This, mm. this was his thing, his great contribution to energy, which was stillborn. Um, and I do not include gems, because I don't think that's a okay. great contribution. Uh, we'll see what happens with that. If you give that a, an Abercrombie legacy point, I think we're going to be unhappy with it. Uh, but anyway, um, the, the authority never really got off the ground. And people universally were saying, 
don't make more bureaucracy. We've got enough bureaucracy. This is just going to make a layer right. of bureaucracy. And P.S., what do you think GEMS does? Ho, ho, there's another layer of bureaucracy. It's another layer, um, and the new governor will have to decide how to proceed with that. Yeah, he, I hope he doesn't, actually. Yeah. Anyway, okay, so th that's the authority. That was interesting. And the cable, and I was, the cable was linked with Big Wind, and Big Wind has such opposition, and people, you know, who oppose the, the wind aspect opposed the cable because I think you could only conclude it was an intrinsic part of that of that project, right? It was, but um, at, at that level it was. But Neil Abercrombie was also pushing the smart grid, which HECO is very slowly adopting, and was also pushing wheeling. And wheeling was prominently displayed as part of the energy plan, where if a government entity has renewable energy they produce, and they produce more than they need, they can rent the transmission line and ship it to another government entity which needs it. Mm -hmm. And that has been around for many, many years and did not advance at all under the governor. Yeah, although he gave lip service to it. I mean, if you asked him midterm, are you in favor of this? He would say, yeah. Yeah. And um, Richard Lim would say, yeah. And Mark Glick would say, yeah. I mean, I, you know, as of last week, I think if you asked them, <laughs> they would say, yeah. Although, you know, even a casual observer would say, well, if you find that nothing is happening, over a four, five, six year period, you have to conclude it's not going to happen, not on this, this watch anyway. Um, and I think the, you know, you can say that there were a lot of environmental uh, concerns about it. I, I saw some you expressed early on. Um, but I think what killed it was uh, spending, you know, an unknown amount of money, maybe a billion dollars um, for that, uh, even while we had this race to the moon, race to the sun. I like that better race to the sun on solar, uh, where it looks like it looked like distributed energy would be, you know, the preferred paradigm. Yes. Um, and that and that, you know, precludes the necessity for spending a billion dollars on a cable. Um, and the way Next Era has presented it in, in two different ways. One is a cable from Oahu to Maui and wind farms on Maui. Second is a cable to Lanai and wind farms on Lanai. So both of those would become alive now. But under Neil Abercrombie, um, he pushed both of those, and they did not advance at all under his administration. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's really an open question as to whether there'll be a cable now. Yeah. Uh, I yeah. Know, you know, as, uh, as I heard one, uh, one fellow from the next era say, it, the technology, and Alan Oshima would say the same, the technology has moved so fast, you have to reevaluate. You have to see, I mean, this is so with everything, especially big projects. You have to see whether that, that technology um, has changed in a way uh, to change your thinking about that project. You know? Right. And it's, it, this is all a race against the speed at which technology develops. That's what it's yes. all about. Anyway, I mean, I would, I mean, if you are saying, Henry, that the Abercrombie administration did not really do anything on energy, I, I would have to, uh, have to agree. If you were not saying that, I would say it myself. <laughs> I, I would say that energy was not a highlight of his successful administration or unsuccessful administration, depending on case your point maybe. of view. <laughs> oh, <be> so careful. <laughs> okay, let's move on to the, uh, you know, the big, the big issue of the day. You wrote about this already, and I have the feeling you're going to be writing about it for a long time. <laughs> it's, it's going to be, your career going forward, Henry, is going to be all about this issue. I imagine it's going to be on a lot of people's minds over the coming year because if it goes through it would radically change a lot within Hawaii if it doesn't go through it would be because a lot of people are organizing around it on many different levels uh, organizing around it meaning organizing, uh, organizing in opposition in opposition it. yeah well I think uh, you know the stockholders probably will approve of this you know I think it requires a certain percentage of stockholders to approve uh, because they make out and, yeah. it's, and it's money. And some people on paper have made a lot of money already because they held the stock. My wife said to me, how come you didn't hold the stock? I said, well, you know, it was going down, I said to her. You know, who knew? Who knew? And as a disclaimer, our two shares at Life Land are going up also. <laughs> Big bucks. <laughs> so here we are, you know, I mean, for at least two or three years. And you were part of this. Uh, the utility became, uh, what do you call it? With, 
the punching bag, the punching bag, pinata. <laughs> Every, everywhere in, in, you know, in, the, in the playing field, you saw people throwing darts at it. I mean, it's too bad, really. And then I've always I've told you before, I've said that, uh, you know, a little mediation, a little maybe a beer once in a while, you know, would have helped to ameliorate that. Because this is a land of aloha, theoretically, you know. Well, I like to think that in the land of aloha, we treat people with respect and we're hard on the issues. Okay. So there are some good people at Hawaiian Electric. There are some people at Hawaiian Electric who are on, who see the future, some who don't, but they're all basically good people. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, it is our utility. And, and the uh, really ironic thing is that uh, as soon as this deal was announced, people are saying, wait a minute, this is our utility. This is our local utility that we love so much. And how can we let these guys come in from outside? I say, wait a minute, <laughs> that's just looking for a target no matter where it is, and it's just sort of this basic pervasive negativism, and we really have to look at this more objectively than yes. just looking for a target. Um, so, I mean, I, I've always felt that it's our utility, and uh, there are ways to make a local company, you know, meet the standard we have for it. Uh, but I think uh, the legislature and the PUC and um, uh, name them, you know, uh, and, and um, the public, uh, you know, didn't really give them enough of a break to have them do what they wanted to do to encourage their executives. I think Alan Oshima was a really good thing because he's a he's a communicator, and in the end, communication is so important. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm sure you and I agree that going forward, that looked pretty good to have a new executive in there, you know, maybe a new a new deal, so to speak. And what he said only October 1st sounded like a new deal. Now this. This is really a surprise. And you wonder how long it has been in the works. Of course, you have to, because a deal of this magnitude, $4.3 billion, is not something you do yesterday. Right. Uh, you, you have to take some time, due diligence. You have to, you know, sort of sidle up to it, make friends, all that. And, and that sort of leads to um, a few days ago, a couple of weeks ago, Giovanni left from HECO, a high-ranking person within the company. Um, and now that makes sense if he knew something was coming and he wasn't going to rise up. Hmm. So there are, you can look back and see all these sort of signs indicating that something was happening, but you don't, you couldn't see forward. No, no, I don't think anybody could see forward. I mean, or even know when to start looking to see forward. But here we are, and uh, I'm, I'm very impressed with this company as opposed to maybe other utilities in, in the country and the world. Um, they have familiarity with Hawaii. They have holdings here. They have been coming and going and inter interacting with the, com with, the, with the state for a while. They know the people. They know the players. They know energy in Hawaii. And they you know, make a deal that's going to cost $4.3 billion. Now, that's a commitment. Uh, and they have resources, experience. I and mean, if you hear them talk about it, it sounds like they know about stuff that maybe we don't know so much about locally. They know on a national level, they know in the billions where we don't maybe have that kind of resource to know those things about the technologies and the options for, you know, utility company. It sounds also like they've been successful. Um, now, you wrote a, a piece the other day, which also piqued my interest, where you had, uh, I, you, you never actually tell where it came from, but you had a sort of pie chart on, um, you know, uh, what, what they were doing. And I noticed there was coal in there, there was LNG in there. Uh, and there was uh, nuclear in there, uh, and that the percentage of uh, actual renewables was not that great. It but was, it, it was 0.14% solar. And I, you know, I get a disconnect on that, because I hear them saying, and I see the, you know, the, the, the press, that they have plenty of experience, plenty of success in renewables, and they're committed. A lot of it is to wind, by the way. Maybe Florida has a lot of wind, or they have holdings around the country which are involved wind. Right. What, what um, Next Era has done is sort of bifurcated their company. So in the, comp in the state where they have the utility, Florida, they downplay efficiency, they downplay renewables. In states without the utility, they're into renewables. Hmm. Interesting. They have, uh, according you know, to their statements, uh, they have a lot of experience in the technology around renewables, uh, committed to making it happen, see Hawaii as a market where they could make it happen even at a faster rate than elsewhere because of general acceptance of the idea of renewables. You know, people in Hawaii don't realize 
that our commitment, our transformation, is, isn't happening everywhere. There are some states it's not happening. Uh, with us, I think most people, if you catch them on a street corner, will say, oh yeah, I like renewables, I want that. Uh, they may have a problem with the price, but they want the renewables. And I think that's one of the things that draws uh, next next area in here, um, that they, they believe, and I think rightly, that people here will want renewables and that they will want to meet that demand. I think one thing that draws them in also is the idea that there can be more wind facilities here. And it's interesting because today's paper talks about how uh, next year it doesn't really like the idea of such high rebates for customers who are installing solar. Of course, the company Nextera uses a different term for their own rebates. It's called the production tax credit, where they get two to three hundred million dollars displaced federal. at the federal level on their income against their income taxes, two to three hundred million per that, year. That would be the case here too. Would it? it would be, but on the one hand, they're objecting to mom and pops getting rebates on rooftop, and they're getting massive rebates at at uh, the federal level for wind. Yeah, I saw that, hundreds of millions. But then that could have happened here, too. It could have. And any wind developer would have been entitled to the same but, benefit. But, but a wind developer who gets that should not turn around and then say, but you should not get it because you're putting solar on your roof. You know, that's a very interesting point. Because, you know, what may be inherent here is that wind is not owned by rooftop people. Wind is not owned by the house up the street. I mean, actually, you know, I always wondered why the guy up the street didn't buy a little windmill, put it on his roof. But I know the answer. Height limits. Yeah, height limits. And the na even if he had a, you know, very horizontal kind of wind turbine, the neighbors wouldn't like it. They wouldn't like anything about it. They would probably give him a hard time. So it hasn't happened. Um, and, and wind hasn't happened in many ways. After the fire with extreme batteries in uh, was it Kahalu there. Uh, you know, Kahuku, that, yeah. Kahuku, that was, that was a problem. And, and people, you know, it's interesting how the public turns off because of a demand like that. And the fire department wouldn't go in because they considered the fumes noxious and dangerous for them. And I don't know exactly what happened. But um, it seems to me that we haven't really realized wind. And Lanai and Molokai, you know, have been a, a step against wind. Um, and I don't think wind has gone as far as it could. On the other hand, solar has gone very far. So inherent in this somehow, if you agree with me, is the notion that, that from the utility point of view, the national utility like Florida Power and Light, um, they would like to see the model of tomorrow's utility be a generator of renewables rather than having you know, 500,000 houses uh, generate their own distributed renewables. I mean, it's a big policy question which Hawaii has not really addressed. And I think if you say that we, we're not going to give you incentives to do rooftop solar, but we will give developers incentives to do, or production tax credits, uh, to give um, uh, you know, developers of wind farms, whatever they might be, uh, federal credits or even state credits, you know, uh, then you're, you're inherent in that is we want it to be at a larger level. We don't want it to be house by house. And maybe that is the future. I mean, we're at a tipping point, don't you think, about going this way or that way? We are at a tipping point, but my numbers in Florida came from Florida Power and Light each year files a 10-year plan with the Florida Public Service Commission, which is the equivalent of our PUC. And in last summer, last spring, last summer, they filed their 10-year plan for up to the year 2023. And they said that solar will account for 0.14% in actual now and in 2023. That nuclear and LNG are the answer for Florida. They had, a, they had uh, uh, increases shown on yes. the chart you published. Yeah. And, and in particular, they believe that LNG is the solution. Uh, fracking and natural gas is the solution to increasing it. So when you say that NextEra wants to see a renewable future, I picture them more as a large energy company that wants to make profit, and whether that profit is nuclear, whether that profit is natural gas, whether that profit is renewables, 
they go where the money is in different cases. I, I agree that they, as any utility, would be and should be and these days could be uh, earning a profit. Uh, I, I think that's their raison d'etre. Uh, and I'm not opposing the profit. I'm just saying that I don't see them as going into renewables because renewables are the way to go. Rather, renewables are the way to go because there's money there. And if, if, if coal were to become the optimal solution tomorrow cost-wise and they could make a profit, they would go that way. Okay, we're going we're gonna to hit that question right after this break and look at all the factors on it. That's Henry Curtis. <laughs> <coughs> and that's Jay Fidel. <laughs> <laughs> Nicely done. Life of the land. Here we are on a Friday in Hawaii, the state of energy. We're talking about the world according to Henry Curtis. We'll be right back. Hi, I'm Ethan Allen. I'm the host of Likeable Science on Think Tech Hawaii. We talk about why people should like science, why science is actually fun, how science is a dynamic and vital part of everyone's life, why everyone, every man, woman, and child on the planet should really know science, should love science, should be familiar with science. So it's a great show. People come on here and have interesting conversations with us. They tell us why they do what they do, why they love it, why we should love it, too. I hope you'll join us every Friday, 1 to 2 p.m. And, of course, you can see it anytime on YouTube. Aloha. Okay, we're back. We're live. We're here with Henry Curtis, Life of the Land, <clears throat> in Hawaii, the state of clean energy, talking about the biggest story of the year? No. Of biggest the decade? Biggest energy story of the decade, maybe. Maybe the biggest energy story since the creation of energy with at, at uh, Ilani Palace and Princess K threw the switch and all that. <laughs> and we're going to call this to show the world according to Henry Curtis, which I enjoy. <clears throat> so before we, before we went to the break, uh, you know, you were saying that the, the likelihood is that, um, that the, the, you know, the profit motivation of, of this utility or any utility would be looking at other sources uh, rather than renewables. And yet, I feel, <clears throat> throw some possibilities at you, I feel that Hawaii is different from Florida. In fact, Hawaii is different from most places in the country. And in one, one of the ways, which appeals to me, and I'm sure it appeals to you, is that we have sort of crossed the Rubicon on clean energy. We yes. are committed to it. I mean, it's a, a variety of things have happened since Linda Lingle that make it clear that the guy in the street will say yes. <clears throat> So that's one factor that any utility coming in here will have to cope with. Um, to go, you know, to go to LNG may involve some resistance compared to clean energy. Uh, to go to coal, obviously. To go to nuclear is, is good. That's you know, I mean, just just ask, ask uh, Jeff Michelina what he thinks of nuclear, <laughs> and you'll watch a nuclear reaction. <laughs> so I mean, there there's resistance over things not renewable. Right. How much of that, I don't know, in a given situation. Um, and I think any renewable company, any company coming into Hawaii has to see you know, what people think. You can't just come in here and stomp around. You, you have to be sensitive um, you know, to the max. Uh, you, have to, you have to pay your dues, so to speak, all that. So <clears throat> could it be that what we have here is a situation where um, whatever its whatever its faults, Hiko has been talking about clean energy and doing some, well, well a substantial amount of clean energy. I mean, we do have a substantial amount, um, and that attracts next year. Next year wants that. Also, next year feels that it can change the way things work on a national, even global level if it can use Hawaii as a laboratory. So it's not purely making money. It's got other, other agendas uh, in mind. And maybe, just maybe, it comes here with the notion of maxing out on clean energy. What do you think? Let's take that um, a step in that direction, a step up. If there may be an intrinsic value of studying how you integrate large amounts of wind with large amounts of gas. Certainly, Maui has the highest percentage of wind and solar on any grid, any modern grid around the world. What about Big Island? Big Island has more baseload geothermal. If you're talking about just intermittent, 
Maui has the highest amount of intermittent resources. Okay. So if but if you take all of them, all renewables, then the Big, big Island, island, is, island is, is, is higher. Huge but, amount. But you can't really take what integrating fixed base load renewables, everybody knows well, how to do that. It's not as challenging, right? Right. The challenge around the world is how to integrate large amounts of intermittent energy. Yeah. And Maui is sort of the cutting edge around the world on how you take a system with large amounts of solar and large amounts of wind and integrate it onto a grid. Does Hitachi have anything to do with that? Hitachi is bringing their money in to study it here. A number of Japanese and Korean firms are here seeing how that's done. But if NextEra is able to test it here and patent the processes, then they would have sort of a leg up around the world on implementing smart grid gas, wind, solar. Don't you think they would be interested in doing that? I think they would be, and I think that is probably a, a fair amount of their motivation. You know, they talk about batteries. They talk about storage. They agree with you and me and everybody I know that storage is the key to all of this. <clears throat> and I wouldn't say it's right around the corner, but incremental steps are happening as we speak. Yes. Maybe some, you know, 22-year-old 22, 22 researcher at Stanford has got something in the pipeline right now going to change the world. That'd be disruptive. Make Bill Gates look like a piker. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, if they succeeded, if they succeeded, the stakes are really high. And if you were them in Florida or anywhere, you know, on the mainland, they have holdings all over the mainland. Um, if you were them, what better place would you pick to try to make this attempt? There's no better place. You would, tr if, if I was them and I was in Florida thinking about this, I would weigh the opportunity to test the smart grid, wind, solar, intermittent loads on Maui as as looking that as a very positive sign. And I would weigh as a negative sign a large monopoly coming into a state, that ha uh, a monopoly that has a tradition of saying, we will own it, we will operate it, it's ours, coming into a state that is becoming far more distributed, where 99% of all <laughs> generators in the state are rooftop solars in numbers. You know, if I were any utility, but next era included these days, I would go slow on the use of the word monopoly because one of those tipping points, forks in the road, is that you, me, and everyone with a little black box uh, can generate our own power. And, and it's coming. I mean, as an option anyway. Uh, whatever any utility does, that's coming. And um, I think if I were them or any utility or Hawaiian Electric for that matter, I would be concerned about people getting off the grid and working on new technology. I, I think that's a real possibility. And if you think of the utility in a box, basically, the, each person is their own utility yeah. and getting off the grid, NextEra can't claim that they didn't know that Hawaii was leaning heavily in that direction. Oh, they know. So they, they won't be able to say, we have stranded assets that we bought without realizing what's going on. <laughs> True, but <clears throat> if you were them sitting in Florida or sitting here in Honolulu, you would be trying to figure out a way to re remain relevant. Now, and I think right. that HECO has been trying to think about that too, uh, and they would tell you, tell you that. <clears throat> so here we are uh, in a place where we're, we're crossing a Rubicon of some kind. It's hard to identify exactly what that is. Um, and it's sort of like the, uh, the merger of Oceanic Cable and Comcast because it, it's, a, it's a smaller um, capital investment in the state with a larger capital investment coming in the state and saying we will bring new technology for you. Uh, we will bring new creative, innovative programs for you, products if you will. Uh, and, and our minds are more open to that than our predecessor. Whether it's true or not, we'll see. Um, but that's pretty appealing. But let's take another break, Henry, and come back and, and see what we think is going to happen in terms of the life of the individual consumer here. Okay. If, you, if you dare go there, you know, I think he'll go there. Okay, Henry Curtis, Life of the Land. This is uh, the world according to Henry Curtis. 
um, in Hawaii, the state of energy. We'll take a short break. We'll be right back. Ted Ralston, folks, host of our show at Think Tech Hawaii called Where the Road Leads, where we talk about technology influencing the future of Hawaii. Technology, of course, is the art of solving problems. We always bring in interesting and informed guests who can see from different perspectives and different points of view how that future might unfold and how technology can assist us in getting there. So once again, join us 4 o'clock to 5 o'clock on Fridays. Uh, Ted Ralston, your host. And please, if you have ideas that you'd like us to address on this show or folks who you think should be on it, let us know. Hey, we're back. We're live. Uh, I'm Jay Fidel. This is Henry Curtis, Life of the Land. And here uh, on Think Tech Hawaii, in Hawaii, the state of clean energy, we're talking to the world, and I guess especially the new world of energy here, with the transaction between NextEra of uh, Florida, Florida Power and Light and Hawaiian Electric Companies. Everything will be different. The world according to Henry Curtis. So Henry, how will the world be different for, say, the consumer? Yeah, and it's okay. We, we footnote this discussion as pure speculation. <laughs> I imagine one thing consumers will want to know are, are the rates going down or up? And that's um, difficult to determine right now because NextEra has basically said the deal will take a year to implement and then for two years we'll go through a holding pattern where we won't change anything. Uh, we won't lay anybody off, whatever. So probably you won't see much, you won't know right away what's happening. So in the meantime, regulators will obviously have to step in and figure out what's going on. The legislature now with the legislature, the Senate, the House, the new governor will need to have some discussions on what's going on. It all has to go up to the shareholders. There are, there are so many different players that need to evaluate what's going on. So, And each one of those players is going to be changing his approach somehow. Yes. yes. Because, including the, the public, you know, for example. Um, <clears throat> but assuming that the interconnection problem is somehow resolved in short order, I'm not getting wood for that. Uh, you know, because if I were, if I were uh, next era, I'd want that. I'd, I'd right. want to fix that so I didn't have that kind of heat on me. It's political heat. You know, and come January 15th, you'd like that not to be in process. <laughs> you'd like to have a solution. So maybe on that. we should thank NextEra for cleaning up the queue before they purchase the company. We'll see what happens. Yeah. But okay, so uh, it's products, it's rates, it's technology. Uh, I think, you know, as far as I'm concerned, if I saw a smart grid around me, if I, uh, if I could check my lights from far away, Right, you know, you, with with my cell phone, as as is possible, and you can do that now, and it has been done, I think in in Nextera for that matter, um, this kind of thing would be would be good. It's sort of it's sort of like this. It's it's the cell phone thing. <clears throat> you know, years ago, cell phones were ridiculously expensive. Right. Um, and now they're not so expensive, and the value is huge. You may not realize you're paying a hundred dollars a month for your cell phone, but but you you don't even know or care. Because the value you get from that technology, from all the, pr all the products on your cell phone is so huge, affects your life in a, such a grand way that it's a bargain. It's, a, it, it's become much more a bargain than it was at the outset, how many, 30 years ago. Um, maybe the same could happen in elect electricity, don't you think? But that's actually combining two very interesting ideas. One is that your cell phone connected to your home computer could monitor everything going on in your house, turn on lights, turn off lights, could turn off your coffee pot at night, could warm it up when you wake up, could control your alarm. That's all telecommunications and your home system. None of that involves the utility. Oh, sure it does. That's, that's the smart telephone to your home energy well, system. I, I grant you that, it's, that, that there's technology out there right now that is theoretically available. It's like uh, Mike Pfeffer and... Uh, his uh, IBIS thing, which is, I mean, th that's what it's about. It's a, it's a mesh network of, of plugs in your house where you can control it. And, and the smart grid is basically the utility having their cell phone to their grid. Yeah, but also giving you products. I think this is coming. So it's, it, Mike Pfeffer is not without competition from the utility of the future because they're going to want to, you don't have to take it, but if you want it, you can get it. And if it's good, like the cell phone, you'll want it. And if it offers you, you know, the pop, I mean, if it saves you money, 
to want it. And if it's slick and you know national in scope and it's got lots of R and D money behind it, like the cell phone did or does, um, you know you, you'll pay the money. Uh, and at the same time, you'll save a lot of money. So it's a tremendous value proposition to have this kind of technology. I mean, we can't even imagine yet what it's going to be like. Yes. Uh, and I think that's where they're headed. Just you know, in a parallel of sorts, that's where Comcast is headed. We try to give us technology we don't have yet. But I think it's even more clear in the case of the electric uh, you know, paradigm. I think, I think we will see huge changes. And we will see, if not a reduction in rates, a reduction in, I mean, an increase in efficiency, a reduction in the overall cost to us. And that's coming. So you and I will have many discussions about this. I mean. <laughs> so what about the government now? How's the government going to change? What is, what is the interaction going to be? PUC, legislature, you know, consumer advocate, uh, you name it. I would imagine from what I, I would imagine that the Public Utilities Commission would open up a docket in a couple months and interveners would flock in. Um, so that would be one process. I would imagine that the State Senate and the State House are going to want to have hearings on this. They'll want to bring in HECO, they'll want to bring in Next Era. They'll not want to commit one way or the other, but they want to have the information. So I would imagine there would be a number of informational hearings about what's going on. How does that change their relationship with, with the current utility, which presumably will go forward to continue to manage electrical production generation in, in most of the state? That will be one interesting thing. And the other interesting thing will be your guest coming up, I guess, in a week, Robbie Alm, who at one time was slated to lead the utility. I hope you're coming. I'll be there. What Henry is talking about is something I'd like to digress for a moment. Okay. Hold your thought. Um, on December 11th at uh, Lundy Care, we're having our Think Tech 15th anniversary party and reunion. We call it Think Tech United. And we'd like everybody to come down there. Uh, why? Because this is very important to us. Uh, and so you can see by the, by the flyer on the screen, Think Tech United features a, a remarks by Robbie Ahm, who's going to talk about leadership. And why do I feel, Henry, that in any discussion of leadership is the discussion of Hawaiian Electric and Next Era and how uh, they do leadership on all the structures in the state about energy. This is going to be a very interesting discussion by Robbie Ahm. It's December 11th. Come. Uh, thinktechhawaii.com. Support us. Go on our, our website, sign up, come and see us. See all the hosts and guests from years, years past. Uh, you know, enjoy the, the kind of crucible we've been creating, but in person, you can shake their hands, you know. Thank you, Henry. <laughs> and, and Robbie represented sort of one faction in HECO, and many thought that he was going to lead the company. Instead, somebody else came in from California to lead the company, and with um, the departure, um, there was going to be a new future and a new opportunity for people to rise up within the company, whether it would be people that Ravi Am would support, whether it's other people. There are different factions within the company. And suddenly, the sort of upper management, the people who are most likely to rise up, will discover that instead of rising up, they now are reporting to Florida bosses. So it may mean a shift in upper management of people who decide that I can't rise up in this company above a glass ceiling because above the glass ceiling are people from Florida. So it will be really interesting if Robbie Alm takes a position or discusses the company and what's going on. I would love to hear that. Yeah, because he's, you know, he understands why electric, uh, as few people do, and <clears throat> he cares a lot about it, and he cares a lot about energy. I mean, nothing's changed for him, really. And, and he headed DCCA also. Yeah. So he has the governmental experience. Yeah. yeah. The Department of Commerce and Consumer Affairs, the consumer advocate, yeah. is in that division. Yeah, what, a, what an interesting moment it'll be to get his take on this. I mean, for him, he must have just fallen down flat <laughs> when he heard about this. I hope he's okay. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I agree with you. There'll have to be changes. There'll be, um, you know, I, I, my guess is it'll be a continuation in ways, in sort, in, in part, of, um, you know, Alan Oshima's idea to reorganize, to revamp the way they do business and to make it more friendly to the consumer and so forth. 
and it's a course, response to public pressure. Yeah. And of course, Alan Oshima was involved in the sale of Kauai Electric Division from citizens in Connecticut yeah. to KIUC. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he's been around the block, yeah. and he was involved in cell phones uh, way back when. Yes. You know, he, he's been a utilities lawyer, uh, a creative one, involved in significant historic deals in the state for a long time. So this is this is a deal which uh, you know it's just it's it's a natural. I think it's a, it's a good idea. Why? Because it's kind of like, uh, I think we've been in a rut. I think everybody's been in his own kuleana, and we haven't really been focused together to get where we want to go. Um, too, much, too much argument. And this is a change-up. This is different. And this is going to cause people to shift their focus, maybe get out of the rut, out of the kuleana and maybe refocus. And at least it's an opportunity for that. So I think all, all things considered, I would favor this deal. I think it's a smart deal for both uh, HECO and uh, next year. I would agree that we were in a rut, mostly because we were sort of at the leading edge of the coming storm across the nation on how you integrate large amounts of intermittents and how you handle distributed generation. We're leading that and therefore we were in a rut trying to figure out what the path forward was. Next Era represents, if you will, somebody who has just built a new entrance ramp onto a different road. <laughs> and, well, and they, they have aspirations of getting on our road yes. for re their own good reasons. And so it's possible that they can have two roads, or it's possible that that road, the old, their old road, or their road up to this point may change a little because of what they learn here. And, and the, the whole thing is, you know, it just begs you to watch and, 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 and follow it as a day-to-day -day thing. I think the newspaper's going to be a lot of money covering this story. And as long as we don't get railroaded, that's fine. Well, <laughs> when I think of, uh, when I think of railroad, I always think of the rail. I, I hope that doesn't happen. That won't happen. So let's go to the other elements here, the other structures. Now, you know, they all have their own ways of doing business. Uh, the PUC has sort of created its own culture in the way it deals with this. Uh, sometimes I think the PUC could have gone to just have a beer. <laughs> but instead, they wrote stinky, uh, you know, addenda to their opinions and, and, and cast uh, all kinds of aspersions that did not, you know, in Hawaii, you do that and it, it burns a hole, you know. Uh, if, if we have an argument it doesn't go away right away. It carries a kind of historical longevity to it. And so if you're going to have a face-to-face -face argument, remember that. you got to keep that in mind. But, but the PUC has had four major audits, 61, 74, one in the late 80s, one in the early 2000s. All four audits said the PUC is reactive and they should become proactive. So now they've become proactive, and some people like yourself, are saying, well, maybe they should have just had a beer instead. My argument would be, the problem is, if you have a beer, who do you invite to the table to have a beer with? Uh, yes, but you know, in the law, there's a, there's, a, there's a place where you can mediate or arbitrate disputes. Yes. The UC has the power to do that, never did it. Never. Uh, and uh, you know, I think there's a lot of room to have a, an affable discussion among the parties, whoever they are, um, and reach conclusions and resolutions of issues um, without without rancor. And what we have now, part of the rut I describe, is rancor. And rancor doesn't help anyone, especially in the state of Hawaii. Hawaii is a state that doesn't do rancor, or not well. Anyway, so my question to you is, what's going to change in the PUC? Granted, this these commissioners feel that they ought to be proactive, and they've demonstrated that in their own way. You can disagree about the style of it, but right. they certainly have been proactive. Uh, I would imagine that's going to stay the way it is, um, but they're still only a quasi-judicial organization, and they can't actually dictate terms, at least not like a legislature. Well, that's, that's interesting because um, on the day of the announcement, um, HECO first talked with their investors. They had an investor conference call. Then they met with the PUC and then they had their press conference. The PUC is able to impose conditions on the sale. Yes, as the uh, FCC is able to 
impose conditions on the Comcast merger. And there's a whole there's a whole body of practice about those conditions, at least at the FCC. Right. I don't know if there's a body of practice in the PUC about conditions because they haven't had a deal like this before. And and I imagine the legislature can also put conditions on it. You say the legislature has to approve this? No. The legislature doesn't have to approve it, and they could just stay on the sidelines. But I don't think legislators would stay on the sidelines. Uh, for sure. example, um, each year the legislature takes up a number of energy bills. Now, should and HECO comes in and testifies whether they support or oppose bills. I would imagine even whether Next Era is actually at the table or not, Next Era would be pulling some of the shots to represent the utilities position on. on well, I'm sure they'll be at the table. They're part of the deal. One of the major the issues. Part, yeah. One of the major issues is liquefied natural gas and whether we should be exempt from the Jones Act. So I would imagine that's one possibility about where the legislature may step in and and either put conditions on or accept or reject that's the use of LNG. I think one of the reasons that we're where we are is we have too many cooks in the kitchen, too many cooks stirring the broth, is that the expression? Uh, and if the legislature gets heavily involved in putting conditions on this deal, making demands, um, it may kill the deal, for one thing, which, I mean, I think that would be a bad, a bad result. Or another company might step in and say, we'll offer $34 this year to buy out the company. Yeah, but then they'll still have to cope with the legislature. They will, but I just want to throw out that other possibility. Interesting. Henry Curtis, a man with a creative blog that you got to look at. What's, it, what's the name again? Ililani Media, I-L-I-L-A-N-I -I -I dot media. All right, Henry Curtis of Life of the Land, who becomes more prolific as we speak. And uh, here in Hawaii, the state of energy, we've been discussing the world according to Henry Curtis. We'll do it again. I'm Jay Fidel. I've enjoyed this discussion. Thank you, Henry. Thank you, Jay. Aloha. Aloha.